Hey everyone, in this episode I'm going to show you how I made these giant octagonal wrenches out of 4140 alloy steel on the DMC2. So what even are octagonal wrenches? I have a friend that collects and trades vintage stoplights and other road signs. Apparently there's a lot of people that do this and they can make a decent profit. He mentioned to me once that the stoplights all have an octagonal main nut that secures them from the top, and that this special octagon shape is to prevent people with normal wrenches from being able to get to them. So when you do buy one of these old retired stoplights, you kind of have to disassemble and replace the broken parts using pipe wrenches on the nut and incorrect tools that risk damaging and scratching the paint and so on. So I told him, you know what, a simple flat steel wrench is actually a great job for the DMC2, so I'll make you a pair. So after some back and forth, here's a simple design I came up with. This wrench is made out of a 3 8 inch thick flat bar of 4140 alloy steel, and it has a 2.5 inch flat to flat octagon end for the nut that it's made for. The whole thing is about 9 inches long, and just for fun I added the 2.5 inch label and his initials to make it a little more unique. So I'm actually making two of these wrenches. I ordered the metal from metal supermarkets at pretty much the exact size that I need for each, and I decided I would machine the top half and shape of the wrench out from each piece by using the super glue and tape trick on the DMC2 bed. The metal is really greasy which is not going to work with the tape, so I used alcohol pads to clean off the bottom faces until the greases were gone so that the tape would stick. Once the tape is laid down, I need to press it in and you can see the color change of the tape when it properly adheres to the surface. I like to use an allen key and rub the tape down and you can really see how it all sticks once it's pressed in. I cleaned the bed off as well on the DMC2 with a rag and more alcohol pads and applied tape and pressed down the same as before. Once the two tape surfaces are prepared, the next step is to apply super glue and quickly stick the part down and press for a few seconds to get it to stick well. I'm doing both pieces of metal side by side at the same time. The first operation I'm doing on these wrenches is a facing operation with my 10mm insert mill. This tool is great for this type of application. I'm running at fairly heavy feeds and speeds that I've figured out previously in my feeds and speeds video. So over on the machine, I loaded the insert mill, keeping the total stick out of the tool as short as possible so that there's minimal tool deflection. The facing operation has its origin set at the lower left top part of the material. So what I'm doing on the machine is just arbitrarily centering the tool around that area to zero the x and y axes, and then using the height buck to properly set the z axis. This is fine since the x and y position are not super critical for facing, only the z height is for this operation. The facing operation went well, it was a bit heavy but the tool held up fine. You can kind of notice it sounds a little different each time it changes direction, so that might be an indication that the tool doesn't like entering the cut in certain conditions, not really sure. Anyways, it turned out fine, and I reset the X and Y over the second plate to face that one as well. You can see the chips that came off that operation were really hot, and they formed these nice curly blue little chips which is a good indication.
So for the next operation, I'm using a 4mm end mill to contour out the entire wrench in multiple small step downs, and I'm leaving very thin tabs at the bottom and a small amount of stock to leave around the perimeter of the wrench. I'm doing the exact same thing for the fork section of the wrench, except without the tabs. After that, I'm doing a very tiny and slower contour to clean up the faces and get them down to the exact dimension I want. I found that doing this typically gets things to within about 0.005mm tolerances, or well within the tenths if you're working in inches. I'm doing that contour on the outside of the wrench, and then on the inside nut section. And finally, there's a little bore for a hole at the back. So back on the DMC2, I set the X and Y over an arbitrary corner again, and set the Z height with the height bar. And you can very quickly see here I made a mistake. That arbitrary location for X and Y was OK and Y, but a little too far off for X, so the wrench got cut a little offset in the material. I let the entire thing finish anyways, it's just the back end of the wrench, so it'll still be functional, just a little ugly. So continuing on from that, the next operation is the text on the wrench. The smallest end mill I had on hand was a 1mm diameter, so I designed the text in a font that was as rounded as possible and made the font just large enough for a 1mm end mill to get all over inside of it. I did an adaptive clearing with ramping to get down in and remove all of the material, and then a cleanup contour around the edges to smooth it out, since adaptives do not leave nice smooth wall surfaces.
The text came out really nice, although it took a while because I was being conservative with the feed rate as not to break the tiny tool. The last operation for this side of the wrench is a chamfer around the edges and a tiny chamfer on the text edges. So I swapped tools again and reset the Z height with the puck, and then ran the chamfer operation. And it's kind of hard to tell, but there was a little error again with the X axis being slightly off. And this time it was because I wasn't careful checking the setup and making sure it was identical to the previous one. The X was slightly off for whatever reason. It needs to be exactly the same because every time I switch tools, I'm not reprobing X and Y because I'm trusting that they stay saved between operations. Anyways, here's how the first one came out. It does look really nice, just minus that offset chamfer really. Thinking back, I could actually save the part by redoing a deeper chamfer to sort of overwrite the previous one. So taking the wrench off was a little difficult, which is a good thing. That means the glue and tape held really well. I use a very sharp bent screwdriver and it does the trick once you find somewhere to catch under an edge. So now onto the second wrench. This time, now that I worked through the whole process and found my mistakes, I'm ready to cut a proper wrench out. I haven't changed anything in the cam process except for that incorrect chamfer origin. The wrench cut out well in the center of the material this time. And then the 1mm text was the exact same thing as before, and then the chamfer was the same as well, now in the correct location. I used my phone to get a closer view of the chamfering, which was extremely tiny. The actual chamfer itself is hard to see with the naked eye. Everything this time came out perfect and looks amazing. So since the material held down so well, I know next time that I probably don't even need to use tabs under the wrench. The more surface area there is under your part, the more glued area there is behind holding it down. When the part comes off, it does have those extremely sharp tabs left over. So what I do is use a pair of flush cutters to snip them off since they're so thin and this works well but does leave a burr behind. Not an issue though, because the backside needs to be faced and chamfered as well. So back on the CNC, I've put the vise on this time so that I could hold the wrench up in some parallels and do the final facing and chamfer. You can see I have a pretty bad overhang, which is where the part is sticking out in the air. The problem with that, as you'll hear, is that it causes a little flexing and bouncing in the part and affects the surface finish. I could tell that over the far edge of the wrench, the cut was not as super smooth as everywhere else, so I decided to run it again just to take a tiny skim off, which should have much less cutting forces going on. It came out much smoother, but I noticed something. That chattery cut at first sounded a little off towards the end, and when I removed the insert mill after the second pass, the edge was chipped, 
I took it apart and you can see here that a tiny chunk is missing right out of the cutting edge. And this is why I love these tools. They can take a beating, but when they do break, the insert itself has a second side to it. And the entire insert only costs a few dollars. If this was an equivalent sized end mill, that would have been maybe a 30 to 50 dollar mistake right there. Anyways, back over to the machine, I loaded the insert tool and zeroed it again. I did also use a probe this time to get the exact tip of the wrench located, but I did not manage to record it. So as the chamfer tool is run, there is still a little noise on that long overhang area, but it came out extremely smooth anyways with no issues. So now I swapped out for the second wrench and reprobed. And since the chamfer tool was loaded, for whatever reason I decided to chamfer first, Now for the facing operation, I did a little modification in CAM to change the toolpath. Instead of facing over the entire bar and wasting time cutting air, I selected the wrench outline as the area to machine. This only saved like 2 minutes of machining time, but you can imagine if you were doing lots of these, that time adds up. I also changed it to be a slightly more shallow facing cut than before, because I know that that overhang section gets chattery, and I don't have anything to support it, nor is it even worth doing something about, since the job will be done in 2 minutes anyways. So doing the chamfer first was kind of pointless, so I reprobed the height and did the chamfer again. And now both wrenches are completely finished. Here's the first one, everything is great minus the two mistakes I made. The surfaces are all extremely smooth and it feels great in the hand. And now the better second wrench with no issues. This one feels amazing because every single surface and edge and corner is machined and silky smooth. This is something I would put in a fancy box and ship to a customer. Even the text feels great with that tiny chamfer because you can feel your skin sliding over it and not catching on the internal corners of the letters. So here's something I want to check, just how accurate the 2.5 inch flats came out on the wrench. This is definitely not the best tool or the best way to measure, but you can still see that it's pretty much dead on 2.500 inches. I'm extremely happy with these parts and with the DMC2 for performing so well in this tough material. So I sent the wrenches off to my friend and they work great. Now he's able to dismantle and fix his stoplights with proper tools and not a giant pipe wrench smacking around. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Be sure to check out the others and maybe share it with people you think could benefit. And thanks for watching.